Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? Okay, so a few remarks. Uh, so <laughs> last Friday or so I noticed that Quiz 13 was not available to register, so I asked the testing center to get that, you know, what, what, what's up with that? And then they said, oh yeah, it wasn't available, but now it is. And so I sent y'all a message saying, okay, it's available but apparently it still isn't available for registration. So I'll get that figured out today. I'll go walk over there and see what's happening. And then I'll, I'll send y'all another message. Uh, so as for written homeworks, I'm gonna keep posting some, but I'm not gonna collect any more. That is to say, no further written homeworks need to be turned in. Now, that please don't interpret that as license just to ignore the rest of them because there's going to be material on the exam that more or less is just like them. So it's really in your interest to solve them once without looking at the key <laughs> and then checking to see whether or not you did it and correcting it, etc. So treat it just like a normal written homework. So I won't collect it, but I'll, as always, be glad for you to come in and ask questions about it and whatever else, what have you. And then the final exam is Thursday, two Thursdays from now, which is to say four plus seven days from now, or three plus seven or whatever. Any questions about any of that? Yes? Is the final the same format as the last test? Yes, the format's the same. There'll be a mandatory portion, you do that. When you're done with that, then you do the redo portion. The only, the, there, there'll be two major differences, well, minor maybe is that the, the mandatory portion will have more questions and the exam itself will be longer duration. So the midterm exam was 75 minutes. The final exam will be 165 minutes, a full 90 minutes longer. So you'll still have to pick from six the quizzes, three quizzes? You'll be able to pick questions. questions Yes, you'll be able to pick up to six from quizzes eight through 13, in inclusive. Other questions? And I think it would be just terrific if everybody just aced it. That'd be terrific because the, there's two easy, c for mostly selfish reasons. Well, I mean, I do want you to do well. I really do. But you have to always hold that to be suspect when someone says, I want you to do well, unless they're your parent, right? But I can just tell you selfishly that I hope that you do well, because there's two kinds of things that are easy to grade. Perfectly correct answers and blank answers. <laughs> Everything in between is where the work is. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, good. So now we're in... Uh, section 6.1, which is exponential functions. Uh, so, we'll start out with definition. So, expressions of the form. Expressions of the form a to x, where a is a constant, which is positive and not 1. So a to x, where a is constant, positive, not 1. These are called exponential expressions. And then two, a function defined by an exponential expression is called an exponential function. Okay, 
So let's get our bearings here. So how about f of x is 2 to x? Is this an exponential function? And the answer is yes. It's an exponential function. This number, a, is referred to as the base. For this particular exponential function, what is the base? 2. So this is said to be exponential function in base 2. Okay, how about um, g of x is pi to x. Is that an exponential function? So there's just three requirements on the base. And these are the requirements. What are the requirements? Constant, positive, not 1. Is it an exponential function? Yes. And it has base pi. There's no situation outside of a math class that I've ever seen that there's an exponential function of base pi. But, in principle, there's nothing wrong with it. Three, how about h of x is half to x? <coughs> is this an exponential function? So if it is, you should be able to tell me the base and, and tell me that it satisfies the three requirements for a base. So what's its base? Half. Does half satisfy those three requirements? Yeah. Is half constant? Sure is. Right. Is it positive? Yeah. Is it not one? Yeah. Okay, how about uh, p of x is negative 3 to x? Is this exponential? No. Why not? Well, the base is a constant, and the base isn't 1. <laughs> Ah, uh, but it's not positive, right? So, no, not that one. How about this one? No, it's not. Because right? one is not a legitimate base for an exponential. The reason why is because well, in the end, it has to do with just the definition. But the reason, the reason why is that you want uh, exponential functions to be invertible. We want them to be invertible functions eventually, which means that they have to be one to one. So how about, how about this, this, uh, this function right here, as it's written? What do, you, what do you get if you plug in three? One. What do you get if you plug in 33? Also 1. So this function is, n is not injective. It's not 1 to 1. So this is not an exponential function. How about this one? <coughs> P, Q, R, um, S. Uh, is <coughs> this. Is 
strong. Is it or is it not? Yeah, for one, for one thing, it's a quadratic. It's the standard quadratic. But what's, so the base, if anything, is what? X, which notably is not what? Constant. So this is not, this is not an exponential function either. However, I'd like for you to observe the at least superficial similarity between these two. One looks like 2 to x, and the other x to 2. So it's just like I switched the positions of two symbols. But this one, the exponential one, is constant base with variable exponent. And now th this is reversed. Now variable base and constant exponent. This is a polynomial. This is an exponential. And this minor change of position makes all the difference in the world. So now let's see, let's see what occurs when you do that. So let's say let f of x be that function, 2 to x. Uh, in the first place, I want you to evaluate this table of values. Negative 3, negative 2, <coughs> negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So now, I want to show you the outstanding, where evaluation is concerned, the outstanding characteristic of exponentials. So let's start out with an easy, easy one. That is to say, what do, what do you get if you plug in 1? You get 2. Now, from here, everything, I claim, will be very easy. Because from here, to move to the right, all that you must do is multiply by the base. So what is the base? 2. So to move one position to the right, what is the answer? 4. What's this one? 8. Now let's check ourselves because that seems like you might think, ah, that seems a little too good to be true. What is 2 to 3? Is it 8? It is 8. And then what would this one be? 16. Okay. Uh, so from here, uh, the first one that we, that we did, to move to the right, you multiply by 2. What do you do to move to the left? Divide by 2, right? So from here, 8 to 4, you divide by 2. 4 to 2, you divide by 2. So what's this one? 1. It's 1. Now, does that stand to reason? Is 2 to 0 actually 1? It is. Because remember, that's one of the very first things that we talked about, literally, like if you go to the first page of the notes. Maybe the first tens of pages of notes or something. Very near the beginning. Uh, any number to 0, to exponent 0, is 1. Uh, 2 to 0 is 1. Uh, million to 0 is 1. Uh, and there's, there is actually one exception to this. What's the one exception? 0. 0 to 0 is not defined. 0 to 0 is not defined. OK, so moving further to the left, what's this one? Half. What's this one? 1 fourth. And what's this one? 1 eighth. OK. Now, for those of you who are just perhaps a little bit uncomfortable with this, uh, do recall, please, that 2 
with exponent negative 3, what would I need to do to write this uh, but with a positive exponent? Put it in a denominator. So this would be 1 over 2 to 3. And then now 2 to 3, that's, this is something you just must know. 2 to 3 is 8. So this is an 8. OK. Now, starting from here, I think we can all agree that if you plug in x is 1, that the output is 2. And then to move to the right, you multiply by 2. So multiply by 2, multiply by 2, multiply by 2, multiply by 2. And from here, you divide by 2 to move to the left. So divide by 2, divide by 2, divide by 2, divide by 2. Well, then what is going to be the SIGN of every one of these red numbers? They're all going to be positive, right? Because they can all be, they can all be achieved from this 2, which is positive. And if it's to the right, I need to multiply by some 2s. And if it's to the left, I need to divide by some 2s. So there's no way that this process will ever become negative. Now, these numbers are going to get as small as you wish, small and positive, but still positive. So like, you can think of, you know, if you've got buddies, you know, you take one pizza and then you cut it in half, and then you say, okay, well, now we'll cut those in half. Now you have four slices, now you cut all those in half, eight slices. And no matter how many times you cut all of them in half, they still have a positive size, right? Ignoring when you get to atoms, I suppose. Eventually, it's not pizza anymore. OK, but all of these are all positive. So these are all positive. So let's plot. What we have here. Now, normally, I take these to be integer values, but the exponential grows quite quick. So I'll take the halves to be the integers. So when you input 0, the output is 1. And then now, every time I move to the right, one unit, I double the height. So output 2, output 4, output 8. And then the next one would be output 16, which is already well off. It's way up here, even off the, the thing already. Okay, then from here, moving to the left, what do I do with the output? I have it, right? So half this way, then half, then half. So those are the seven values that we're able to plot. And if you plot them, if you were to plot many more, and, and and connect the dots and this kind of thing, then the result would look like this. So that's, you can see it getting arbitrarily small, but positive right there. And then on the right side, it's getting big quite quickly. Any question about this one? So notably, this could not possibly be the plot of a polynomial, even ignoring the fact that we know it's not. Just looking at the plot, it couldn't possibly be the plot of a polynomial. Why not? Well, we know the global behavior of polynomials. The left and right side of polynomials, they have to, you know, they have to both each be going up or down, which is to say the left side for a, pol for a non-constant polynomial either needs to be going eventually up or eventually down. But this is not going eventually up or down. It's going to zero. And that side's going up. Okay? So it couldn't be a, po a polynomial and certainly not x squared because it would be a parabola. 
Okay, what if we do it the other way? What if we consider say let h of x be half to x and we make this table. And again, same trick, really, is that it's quite easy to plug in 1. What do you get if you plug in 1? Half. And then, every time you move to the right, you multiply by the base. What is the base? Half. So then, what's this one? fourth. And the next one? An eighth, right? So is there any question about these three? Every time you move one to the right, you multiply by the base. You multiply by half. So what would the next one be? A sixteenth. Then to move to the left, you divide by the base, which is to say you divide by half. Well, usually you don't say divide by half. What do you usually say? Multiply by 2. So now, OK, that's interesting. What will this one be then? 1. Now, does that, does that jive with the rest of the things we know? Which is to say, what is half to 0? It's 1, right? Because anything that's not 0 raised to exponent 0 is 1. So in particular, half to 0 is 1. OK, what's this? 2. What's this one? 4. And this one? 8. So now, for those of you who are maybe slightly uncomfortable with that, well, let's consider half to exponent, say, negative 4. Well, half to exponent negative 4, I don't really like dealing with negative exponents. So I think it would be just terrific if I could redo this but use a positive exponent somehow. So notice that I'm changing it from exponent negative 4 to exponent positive 4. Well, what is the cost inside of the parentheses of doing that? reciprocal, right? So now it's 2 over 1. So if the thing inside of here had been 9 over 10, then that would be 10 over 9 now. So then now the rules of exponents say that the exponent distributes into the, into the division like this, 2 to 4 over 1 to 4. And then what's 2 to 4? 16, and then what's 1 to 4? Just 1. Which is to say, if you're right here and you wanted to move one more position to the left, what's the output? 16. Now, similarly to the last one, I'd like for you to observe that, again, these are all positive. They're all positive. But there's something, in, in comparison to the previous exercise, there's something sort of curious about the tables. How is this table of red values related to the table on the previous one? Mm -hmm. So notably, this is, the, this is what we did first. And here's what we're doing now. There, this, this one is the same as the first one, but backwards. Right? 
That is to say, this one has an 8 all the way to the right, but this one, the 8 is all the way to the left. And then you read, you read them backwards. So these tables are backwards. How will the pictures look? Reflected, right? You'll take this one and do it. So let's, let's check that. Let's plot it now. So they're plotting those. All exponentials go through this. When you input 0, you output 1. And then now this one, as you move to the right, the output halves. So half, half, half. You move to the left, the output doubles. So 2, 4, 8. So those are the seven points we were able to plot. And then connecting the dots. The result looks like this. Which, yes, is the mirror reflection of the first example. Any question about these? So, that's the the motivation for the following remark, and that is that suppose we have any exponential. Let f of x be a to x with a is constant, positive, and not 1. Then there's really just two kinds of, of possibilities. Exponentials that look like this, and exponentials that look like under this. So I'm going to draw two possibilities. Uh, in either case, when you input 0 to an exponential, what is the output? It's got to be 1. So that means that in my drawings, both of them have this. Both of them have that point. One of the exponentials that I'm going to draw is going to look like this. And the other And my question to you is, is that which one is going to be which? Something must be true about the base for this one. What is it? A fraction. So here, this is the case that 0 is less than a is less than 1. So that is to say, in this case, the base is a fraction. Well, I hope that you can see that that kind of makes sense because if the base is between 0 and 1 and moving to the right is equivalent to multiplying by the base, then that means that when you move to the right and you multiply by a and a is between 0 and 1, you've got to get smaller. Okay? So that's why it's going down with a, with a base that happens to be between 0 and 1. What must be true about this one? Greater than 1. Which is to say, every, for, for both of these, every time you move to the right one unit, you multiply by a. So that means that for a's more than 1, you're going to get bigger. And for a's between 0 and 1, 
you're going to get smaller. So, now, conversationally, when you talk about these, this is called, this one is called exponential decay. And this one is called exponential growth. Okay, these two situations occur uh, quite frequently in nature, at least for short amounts of time. Uh, because in nature, very often, uh, the way a system changes in time is proportional to its current size. The, the a sort of standard example for exponential decay is something called radioactive decay. So, on the table of elements, there's an element called carbon. It's an important one. <laughs> Um, there's some carbon in you. In fact, there's a lot. Uh, every element on the, on the periodic table is, is uh, uniquely characterized by the number of protons. So how many, um, how many protons does carbon have? <laughs> Six. <laughs> Someone's saying, excuse me, I was told there would be no chemistry in this class. <laughs> Six protons in a carbon. But besides, and, and those protons are located in the middle of the atom called the nucleus. But besides protons, what else can be in a nucleus? Neutrons. And different kinds of carbon have different quantities of neutrons. But... If you were to randomly pick a particular carbon atom, how many neutrons would it almost surely have? Six. <laughs> now we're getting pretty specific knowledge. So, so carbon atoms must have six protons, and the majority of them have six neutrons. But there's a minority of them that have eight neutrons, and these are referred to as carbon-14, because six plus eight is 14. So if you've heard of, car of radioactive carbon dating, carbon-14 dating, that's what they're talking about. So you take atoms with differing number of neutrons. These are called isotopes. That's their name. So the one that I'm going to talk about is there's another very exciting atom called uranium. It has, I think, 92 protons. And it can have a wide variety of neutrons, actually. Uh, the more protons you have, the more variety of neutrons you're able to have. And there's one particular isotope of uranium that's particularly exciting called uranium-235 because it has... I, I don't remember. I think uranium has 92 protons. It might, it might be something else. But U-235 is just however many more neutrons you need so that 92 plus whatever is 235. Okay. <coughs> So uranium-235 is exciting because, well, you can make nuclear weapons from it. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's probably the most outstanding reason why it's exciting. But another reason why it's exciting is that you can make power stations from it. Okay. At any rate, uranium-235 has the interesting property that after 100,000 years, a mass of it will have decayed by half. Half of it will be gone. So if this was a one kilogram block of uranium-235, then in the first place, we would all probably die <laughs> as a result of that being an exceptionally dangerous situation. But let's ignore that for a moment and say that um, we've got a block of U-235, one kilogram of it. Uh, after 100,000 years, half of it will be decayed. That is to say that this will still be a one kilogram block, but only half of it's going to be U-235. The rest of it's going to have decayed into other products, eventually ending in lead. So after, if th supposing that we start with 
with this one kilogram block, after 100,000 years or so, it's half a kilogram. How about after 200,000 years? One fourth. How about after 300,000 years? An eighth, right? Because every 100,000 years, it's halved. It's halved. That's why it's called a half-life. So, uh, now, because, because uranium-235 is known to decay to lead, that's how we can tell that the age of the Earth is about 4 billion years. Because you get uranium-235 floating around in the liquid rock, and then it solidifies, and once it solidifies, no more U-235 can be put in it. In fact, everything is now still like a crystal. But nevertheless, those little uranium atoms, they still want to change into lead. So you can take a rock, and you can measure it, and you can find the oldest rocks that we can find, and you measure the ratio of lead to U-235, and you can observe that, ah, well, that means that the Earth is 4 billion years old. Pretty cool. So, radioactive decay is the standard science model for this one. Radioactive decay. The standard model for this one, for growth, probably, I think, is uh, the best one is maybe bacteria. Uh, so there's a, in biology, for those of you who are taking or will take or have taken biology, uh, there's such a thing called a Petri dish. And more or less, you can understand Petri dish to be paradise for a bacterium which is to say it's the best possible situation that a bacterium could find itself in. It has lots of food and it has no predators. So if you take a petri dish prepared for a, bacteri for, prepared for a bacterial colony and you put a single bacteria in the middle of the dish, then this bacteria finds itself with no predators and ample food, it will grow until it reaches a certain size, and then it will split into two bacteria. So one becomes two, and now there's two in the dish. And let's say that this process takes the bacteria exactly one hour, which by the way is not at all unreasonable for a bacteria. So if we put one right in the middle, after one hour there's two. How many are there after three hours? Eight. How many are there after uh, five hours? Thirty-two. How many are there after mm, thirty-two hours? There's over four billion now. There's over four billion now. Now I'd like to point out something, and that is that how many hours are in a day? 24. And so that means that after 32 hours, which is less than a day and a half, the number of bacteria is now 4 billion times of whatever it was. Now we happen to start with 1. If we had started with 10, now there'd be 40 billion. Okay, so this is the reason why when you're driving on the highway and you see all the little critters that have gotten run over by cars, you never see one that's in good shape. Because besides having been splattered by the car, which is bad enough, if you don't get there within a day and a half, there's already four billion times as much bacteria on that creature as there was to begin with. Okay, so then every, every animal, including human beings, we have bacteria all over us. And, it, and a significant amount of our energy expenditure is just to keep them from killing us, to keep them from growing. As soon as an animal expires, within a day and a half, there's literally billions times as many bacteria on that creature as possible, and they're eating it. Interesting, right? Or scary, you know, <laughs> whatever you want to, however you want to reckon it. Okay, so bacterial growth. Now, because I'm a mathematician, I have to put caveats on this. 
which is to say that the radioactive decay model works quite good when there's several moles of the material at hand, which is to say there's lots and lots of such atoms. When you start getting few atoms, this is not a very good model anymore. And this is pretty good um, as long as there's plenty of food to eat, but you eventually run out of food, right? So then literally the bacteria will just like come up to the edge of the petri dish and then and then it's not exponential anymore thank goodness right because if it continued to be then the whole earth would be consumed by bacteria in a matter of minutes okay or at least at most days okay so then now all exponential functions must pass through this point when you input 0, the output is 1. Supposing that this is 2 to x, <coughs> so there's 2 to x, I have a question for you. How will 3 to x be situated with respect to 2 to x? For example, on the right side, how will 3 to x be in comparison to 2 to x? It's going to be a steeper, a lot steeper, right? Let's consider, um, well, in either case, they both have to start at the green point. They've both got to start there. But now, what if we input 4? into 2 to x. What's the output? That is to say, what's 2 to 4? Sixteen. 16. Well, what about 3 to x? What if you input a 4? 81. So already, for 3 to x, at input 4, you're already at 81. And if we were dealing with the exponential 10 to x, at input 4, you're already at 10,000. It's going up. <laughs> it's going up quick. So like this. Quite quick. That's on the growth side. But on the decay side, how is the green going to be situ situated with respect to the red? It's going to get smaller faster. So it's over on the growth side and under on the decay side. Okay. So now, for various reasons, uh, things like uh, chemical reactions and biological things and other things, nature really does like, at least in shorts, for short amount of time, for appropriate amount of materials. Nature really does like exponential processes for short amounts of time. But nature does not like the base 2 to x, and it does not like the base 3 to x. So now I'm personifying nature, so it's going to have to be in scare quotes. Um, what, what base does nature prefer? So it's like, ah, this porridge is too cold. Ah, but this porridge is too hot. So does anyone know the name of the base that nature prefers? What is it? Yeah, we write it down as E. It is called the natural number, or the natural base. And then does anyone know its numeric value? <laughs> Very good. So 2.7128... Uh, one eight two eight dot dot dot. So this is a number that from now on I expect you to memorize, uh, just like pi. Pi is a fact of the universe. Its value is about three point one four. The natural number is also a fact of the universe. Its value is about two point seven one eight. And then if we were to draw the natural exponential, e to x, 
how would it be situated with respect to the red and the green? Yeah, it would have to be in between them. And it would have to be closer to the green. And it must go through that point. So it looks kind of like this. That's the base that nature prefers. Now, that's kind of a big claim to say that nature, scare quote, nature prefers something. So now I've got to justify that claim. Now, uh, one thing that I'll say just for those of you who are going to go on to take calculus, well, really for everyone, because it's, because it's interesting. But this will be especially important to those of you who take calculus. All of these exponentials go through that point. They all do. And when the red one goes through it, it's kind of shallow. And when the green one goes through it, it's kind of steep. The natural exponential is the exponential, that is to say, the only one, that goes through that point at slope 1. So the red one is going through it at slope less than 1. The green one is going through it at slope more than 1. The blue one, the natural way, is to go through it with slope 1. And in the end, that's the, you could think of that as the main reason why nature prefers this. Okay, good. So now I need to justify why, why do we call this the natural base. Okay, well, so now I'm going to talk about something and it's going to seem a little non sequitur, which is to say, how did we get on this topic? Okay. So this topic is called, is about simple interest. That is to say, we're talking about money now. So everybody has surely heard about money <laughs> and probably heard something or other about interest. So interest is where you, there's sort of two main situations where you find yourself having to deal with it. Is that One of the cases is that if you have a checking account or a savings account, you put money in and the bank says, okay, we're going to give you some money for putting money in our bank. Is that because they just think you're a terrific person? They love you? I mean, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah. So, and then the other situation is that where you say, well, I'd like to go to UTD Bank. Would you give me a bunch of money? And they'll say, yeah, I'll give you some money. But you're going to pay for it. <laughs> right? And that, that exchange is, is called interest. So let's look at it from the positive point of view. That is to say that you've deposited some money. So when you, when you start a bank account, you actually enter into a contract with the bank. It's a legal contract. And what it is is you're saying, OK, bank, I'm going to give you my money. I want you to hold it. And the bank says, terrific, I'm going to hold it. And I'm going to do whatever I want with it um, as long as I have it. And then when you ask me for it, I have to return it back to you within this amount of time and according to these parameters. So do understand that when you put your money in a bank, they are not required to, to return it to you immediately. They're only retired, re, re, uh, required to return it to you according to certain rules, which, which culminate in, in more or less quickly, but not immediately. So what the bank is doing is they're using your money and they're making money with it. And let's say that the, that the bank is able to make 8%. For somehow, they're holding your money, and, and through some magical process, they make 8%. And if you, have a, if you have a one and a quarter interest account, well, that means that you're getting one and a quarter. That's your cut. That's how much the bank is sharing with you the profits of, of holding your money. The bank is taking the bank is taking six and, and three quarters percent and giving you one and a quarter. That's what interest is. And the other point, and the other way around, that's that's where you say, uh, "Hey, bank, I see that you have billions of dollars just sitting there in a big mountain. I'd like twenty thousand of it so I could go to UTD or whatever." And the bank says, "Terrific, yeah." But when when I give you that twenty thousand dollars, that means that I can't use it. 
So I'm, I'm turning over control of that money to you. And that's worth something. So you're going to pay me for that. <laughs> and what the bank's actually doing is they're not actually giving you their $20,000. They're giving you that person's $20,000. <laughs> okay, That's what's really happening. So that's what interest is. So if, if nothing else, of the small number of things that I could have e every student learn in college algebra, this is one of them. What interest is, is it's a contractual agreement over control of a resource. Is the bank says, yeah, I'll give you 20000 but you, it's going to cost you. <laughs> or, yes, we'll hold your $20,000, and we'll give you a cut of how much we're charging that person for holding your 20000 <laughs> Okay. So, that being said, we're out of time. So we'll continue this on Wednesday. Have a nice Monday.